The Texas redbud is one of the earliest signs of spring in Texas, bursting into color before most other plants have yet to even wake up. But that's not all. This tree isn't just ornamental. It's resilient, it's beneficial to wildlife, and it's even edible. Today in this video, we're gonna dive deep into everything you need to know about growing, caring for, and designing with the Texas redbud in your landscape. Where is the Texas redbud native? Redbuds are native all over North America, much of Mexico, but the Texas redbud is native to a range spanning southern Oklahoma, central and west central Texas, and northeastern Mexico. In Texas, it's found in the Edwards Plateau, the Blackland Prairie, which I'm on here in San Antonio, uh, and uh, the post oak savanna regions. So the Texas redbud can adapt well to shallow limestone based soils that are found in many of these areas, but as well is versatile with clay and gravelly clay type soils as well. But as you move westward toward drier parts of Texas and Northern Mexico, the redbud trees tend to grow smaller and they're in fact more drought adapted as there's less rainfall but these might in fact be Mexican redbuds. Redbuds are also commonly found along uh, woodlawn edges and some rocky slopes along streams uh, where they'll receive maybe greater uh, uh, moisture than they otherwise would, but still have the opportunity to remain well drained. As for the benefits of, of having the Texas redbud, first for your landscape, uh, of course it's gotta be the early spring blooms. My redbud here is just about finished blooming, you can see that the, the heart-shaped young leaves are starting to emerge, but this is one of the first trees to bloom in Texas and specifically here in Central Texas, along with the Texas Mountain Laurel, as well the, the Mexican Plum and the Weesach. But the Texas Redbud produces these dense clusters of bright pink flowers before these heart-shaped leaves begin to emerge. And these blooms really make a striking statement, I think, in late winter or early spring, adding some vibrant color when most other trees are still dormant, but certainly signifying some sort of transition of the seasons here in Central Texas. The Texas Redbud is also low maintenance and drought tolerant. So once established, it will require little to no supplemental watering at all. Even in Texas's hot summers, the deep roots of the Texas redbud help them survive dry spells, especially if we've selected the correct site for our redbud. This stresses the importance, I think, however, of making sure you get yourself the right redbud for your range, uh, which we'll talk more about later. But for me, Texas redbuds are, are perfect, uh, very ideal for central Texas. Uh, further west, you wanna get the Mexican redbud and further east, the eastern redbud, but again, more on that later. It's as well a, a really compact, well-behaved and versatile uh, a tree. It has a, a height of about 10 to 20 feet, depending on its conditions, where it's planted. But the Texas redbud is, is small enough and agreeable enough to fit in small urban yards, near patios, or along walkways, which you'll see quite a bit as it's become quite popular in landscape plantings, as it won't overwhelm the space. It's a very agreeable tree. And it serves as a great specimen tree on its own, or as well, an understory tree beneath taller canopy species. So I have a red bud here, which uh, this is the, the third year that I, I've um, had this in the ground on our property. And so you can imagine once it matures, behind me is this very beautiful mature live oak. And so it'll complement that underneath it really quite well. And so I've chosen to have this red bud still in a, in a very interesting uh, focal point in our property, but underneath the live oak behind me. But you gotta talk about, of course, still it's uh, attractive foliage. You know, while still uh, a green, it's an interesting, distinct heart-shaped leaf that emerges, as you can see now, bright green in spring, and then it'll deepen in color in its green color to more of a, a glossy shade in the summer. Then in fall, these leaves turn shades of gold, yellow, or reddish purple. A little, might be depending on uh, the extent of of sun that it's given, but it does add, I believe, some more seasonal interest before the, the leaves drop off. And then finally, the redbud is, is part of the pea family. So it's a nitrogen fixing tree. So it helps to improve the soil quality by fixing nitrogen into the soil, bringing the essential nutrient benefiting the surrounding plant. As for wildlife, 
The Texas Redbud is a pollinator magnet. The nectar-rich flowers early in spring or late winter even attract a variety of native bees, butterflies, and moths. Uh, it's a, a critical early season food source for pollinators. The red bud's also a, a host plant for Henry Elfin's butterfly, serving as essential habitat for the Henry Elfin butterfly caterpillars. As well, the, the birds end up loving the, the seeds and the seed pods of the trees, persistent seed pods that will hang uh, throughout winter will provide food for granivorous birds well into the winter. So the pods can remain attached to the tree for months, uh, ensuring a, a steady food source. And then finally, you know, uh, something to be aware of, this can be a pro or a con. Uh, you need to be deer aware with the Texas red bud. They don't favor red buds, but they will browse the young trees if food is scarce. So in areas with a high deer population, it's definitely best to protect newly planted saplings. As for planting and care, let's start with where to plant the Texas red bud. As for uh, your sun and shade considerations, the Texas red bud might most prefer dappled shade, but you'll certainly see it planted uh, in full sun and it can tolerate it quite well. Uh, while I think that it, it blooms most profusely and earliest in full sun, the trees in these conditions may show a little bit more stress during the hottest months of the year. You'll see their leaves a little bit wilted down. In contrast, red buds that are planted with some afternoon shade, that's more characteristic to our uh, red bud here, uh, tend to look a bit healthier in summer, in my opinion. As for their soil preferences, so the red bud is well adapted to a variety of soils. You don't really have to overthink it. They can do well in a shallow, well-drained limestone soils. The key here is to, to consider the drainage and your placement of it uh, that way, but it's an excellent choice for the Edwards Plateau. Uh, provided though you're, you're gonna be planting it on limestone, it'll be difficult to, to get into the ground. So you definitely need to start with a, a small, young sapling of a tree. You know, so be aware uh, of the deer population in your area. And then uh, it, it'll do quite well still in gravelly parts of the Blackland Prairie, which I'm on here. I've also planted it strategically a bit at the top of this slope before I have a rainwater harvesting berm. So it, it will capture some runoff uh, from our driveway in greater rain events, but I'm not really worried about it sitting in water for all too long or really at all as the water will end up flowing down the slope. So it does tolerate clay soils, but um, it does best in calcareous or rocky soils that drain well. As far as a water needs, once established, the Texas Redbud is highly drought tolerant. However, it may take advantage of some extra uh, moisture in, in storm water runoff areas, and it might make it a, uh, a good candidate for the periphery of, of maybe a rain garden or a natural drainage zone. Uh, like I said, that's why I made the choice I did to, to put my red bud really at the, the top of this slope, the runoff um, on my driveway. Okay, more on choosing the right red bud. So it's important to know that not all red buds sold in nurseries are the same. Uh, and selecting the right variety is really critical for long-term success for your red bud and your landscape. So starting first with the Texas red bud, let's remind ourselves, this is probably the best choice for central Texas because it's adapted really to our average moisture levels. It can handle drier conditions. Uh, it can as well tolerate a little bit moisture on, on wetter years. It has glossier, thicker leaves that help reduce moisture loss. And then the Mexican red bud, further west in even drier conditions in West Texas and Northern Mexico. Uh, that variety is even more drought adapted, has smaller, more wavy edge leaves. You'll notice a, almost a different look completely. Uh, but if you live in the Trans-Pecos or, or arid regions of Texas, this is a much better choice. And then the Eastern Red Bud may be the most popular uh, Red Bud throughout North America and the United States. This is very commonly available in nurseries, but is not well suited to, to Central and West Texas conditions. It prefers richer soils and higher rainfalls, about 35 inches or greater per year. So that's a, a really wet year for us in San Antonio, especially in this age of drought. Uh, and so it might be more welcomed in East Texas. 
Now for companion plants, let's talk about layered plant communities because this is a planting approach where species occupy uh, different ecological niches, ground covers, perennials, grasses, shrubs, and trees, really to help create a dense, resilient landscape that mimics natural ecosystems as much as possible instead of widely spaced individual plants, excessive mulching. This method encourages overlapping vegetation layers to reduce bare soil, suppress weeds, and enhance biodiversity. So this is inspired by the principles in Planting in a Post-Wild World by Thomas Rainier and Claudia West, a really excellent book that uh, helps to introduce a new concept of uh, a landscape design that finds the middle ground essentially between you know, highly landscaped uh, places, but likewise, you know, adapting the naturalistic world more to our, our uh, urban settings as we'll, we'll see. So plants better reflect the place in which they're from. They also better reflect uh, the people, the, the environment in which they exist. And so for me, I want to think about adding some additional plantings here to the Texas redbud, uh, shrubs that maybe add some understory uh, texture and structure. You know, the agarita might be a good option here for the redbud, the, the evergreen kind of prickly shrub with early spring yellow fragrant blooms and, and wildflower, or excuse me, wildlife uh, of friendly berries. I have the coral berry down here as is, but I'd add even greater density if I could at the moment. The coral berry uh, has some nice, you know, bright green foliage. It spreads uh, quite significantly and has uh, berries that, that birds love that hang through the winter and, and early spring, a very important food source. But there's also the opportunity to add some mid-range uh, perennials like the mealy blue sage as it can handle some of the, the kind of dappled sunshade conditions still bloom quite significantly, especially on edges with greater sun. That's a nice one to put along here. Uh, perhaps the rec rock rose as well too with long blooming pink blooms. But lastly, you know, you don't want to forget your grasses and your ground covers. I think the Linheimer muley under the Texas red bud uh, would be uh, a very uh, excellent addition with its, you know, kind of strong structure and movement uh, of its kind of golden growth pattern throughout winter and uh, fall ground covers. You might consider the frog fruit uh, that will add a, an excellent layer to help suppress weeds and attract a number of pollinators. There's so many other things that we should consider integrating uh, into our plantings to not just have you know, our trees here existing in isolation. So a lot of options for you to consider with the Texas redbud. Well worth making some observations out in landscapes around you to see what kind of pairs and complements uh, do well together. But we can do you know, high density with these various uh, layers uh, provided that, that we're strategic about it, and I'd highly encourage it. It's much more interesting, in my opinion, to just constantly be looking at mulch uh, beneath a tree. As for uh, care and maintenance with the red bud, first with watering, like we mentioned, uh, the after establishment, Texas red bud's rarely gonna need any additional watering, especially if you put it uh, in the right location, you're planting it in its native range. Um, supplemental water may be beneficial in extended droughts, but Overwatering can really cause root issues for the Texas red bud, so it's something uh, worth being aware of. As for pruning, uh, minimal pruning is 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 required uh, for the red bud. Uh, besides, you know, maybe removing crossing or damaged branches in late winter, as you would any other tree. Um, if you want to shape it, I'd really avoid excessive pruning, as red buds actually do a, a pretty good job of naturally forming an attractive structure on their own. So you don't have to work with it all that much. It's, it's why it's a very uh, a valuable, versatile plant for your landscape. And just a note on winter hardiness, uh, the, the Texas red bud is gonna be cold hardy in its native range uh, and handles winters well across its range and it's you know not remotely a concern for us here in San Antonio. There might be some dieback uh, that can occur in extreme cold with you know any other plant that you have in your landscape, but the tree will bounce back in spring without an issue. As for any interesting medicinal edible uses, I mentioned at the top that the flowers here of the Texas red bud are actually edible. You can imagine that this might be something that could be used fresh in salads as a potential garnish um, or even I've heard of people pickling the the red bud flowers uh, for their mildly tart kind of citrus like flavor the young seed pods before they mature and harden can also be eaten raw or lightly cooked kind of similar to snap peas um, I, I, I as well in my research found that one of the best ways to prepare them is sauteed in butter, which enhances their, their mild sweetness and crisp texture. So I know I'm gonna be looking out for them this year 
uh, to, to give that a try. But I will say, the flower is fresh, it's a nice little snack. As for propagation, to round us out here, the Texas redbud can be grown from seeds or cuttings, but it's not the easiest plant to propagate. And I, from my research, I, I believe that it's generally best left to experienced growers. Uh, seeds require scarification uh, and stratification to break dormancy, and cuttings apparently rarely root successfully without specialized care. So for those interested in growing the Texas red bread from seed or cuttings, I always recommend the book, How to Grow Native Plants in Texas in the Southwest. It offers excellent guidance on plants like the Texas red bud and almost everything else you can imagine. But I think purchasing a nursery grown sapling is probably the easiest and most reliable option for most. All right, y'all, that's all I have for you on the Texas red bud. Personally, I think it's a must have for anyone in this tree's native range. It's versatile, it's showy in spring and recognized as a relatively fast growing, a small tree. But along with my own experience working with the Texas red bud in my landscape and observations I make out in Texas's natural and landscaped places, uh, there are a number of books and resources that I consulted in producing this video. So be sure to check out uh, EnsembleTexas.com for the complimentary page where all those resources are listed. Uh, and as well, if you want more deep dives on Texas native plants, be sure to check out my Texas Nature Journal playlist for more of those or sign up for my free email series on Texas native plant landscaping at EnsembleTexas.com backslash grow. All right, y'all, I'm Corey. Thanks for watching. Until next time.